Chapter 7 Who is this? demanded Chuck. Please, the woman begged. Whoever you are, you're my only hope. Any minute now, he'll... But her voice was cut off by a man's bellow of rage. While the three teens listened, horrified, the speakerphone amplified terror-stricken screams, and then the sound of shattering glass. Hello! Hello! Chuck said into the phone. And then the woman was back. Please come, she begged again. Please help me! You're my only... There was the sound of a slap, and then a new, gruff voice came on the line. Who is this? the voice growled. What's going on there? countered Chuck. It's none of your business, growled the man. You've got the wrong number. Do you understand? But I heard, Chuck began. The wrong number, the man repeated, and he hung up the phone. Dina, Chuck, and Jade just looked at one another. Finally, Jade broke the silence, her voice soft and sounding scared. That was another trick called, Chuck. Right, she said. Dina had been thinking, or hoping, the same thing. But when she saw Chuck's pale face, she knew it hadn't been a joke. It was real, he said. Unless someone's playing a trick on me. He looked grim and angry. Oh, no, said Dina, her legs suddenly weak. What are we going to do? We've got to call the police, said Jade, reaching for the phone. Wait, said Chuck, grabbing her wrist. How are we going to explain how I happened to make the call? And why should they believe us? They'll think we're just kids pulling phone pranks. Like that bomb threat, whispered Jade. Exactly, said Chuck. We ought to tell someone, said Dina. That woman sounded like she was in terrible trouble. She said he was he was going to kill her. Maybe they were just playing a party game, said Jade, but she didn't sound as if she believed it. That was no game, said Dina. She stood up. If neither of you will do it, then I'm going to call. Chuck snatched the phone off the table. Will you call it, he said. He reached for the phone book. The police emergency number is 911, Dina told him. I'm not calling the police, Chuck said. I'm getting the address. He shut the book with a snap and stood up. You mean you're going over there? cried Dina, horrified. I've got to, said Chuck. I've got to find out what's going on. Let the authorities find out, said Dina. What if there's really a maniac loose? Then I've got to stop him, Chuck said. You heard her. I'm her only hope. I'm going too, said Jade. She began to pull on her final jacket. You can't go over there alone, Chuck. Dina took a deep breath. I think you're both crazy, she said. Maybe I am, too. I'll drive. Chuck doesn't know his way around Shadyside yet. She got her mother's extra car keys from the hook at the bottom of the kitchen bulletin board, then followed the others outside. It was a clear, chilly night with a large crescent moon. Dina slid in behind the wheel, Chuck in the bucket seat next to her, Jade in the back. What's the address? Dina asked, taking the car around the long circular driveway. 884 Fear Street, said Chuck. The people's name is Farberson. 884, said Jade. That must be out near the cemetery. Dina shivered. She had never been to Fear Street at night, and, like most people who lived in Shadyside, tried to avoid it during the day. She turned on Division Street, which divided Shadyside into north and south halves, then south on Mill Street, knowing Fear Street would come up again soon. Although street lamps illuminated the road and the woods to the side, Dina kept seeing things move in the shadows. Chuck and Jade must have felt the same way she did, because nobody said a word until she turned onto Fear Street. At first glance, it could have been any other street, with its old houses and empty yards. But on closer inspection, there was something different about Fear Street. For one thing, there were the ruins of old Simon Fear's mansion, which had burned down long ago, but was rumored to be haunted. For another thing, the shadows on Fear Street were thicker and darker than those anywhere else in town. And most of all, there was a feeling of death, of lifelessness. The lawns were more brown than green, and the scraggly trees had only a few moth-eaten leaves on them. Though lights burned in a few of the windows of the houses on both sides of Fear Street, there was no feeling of warmth, of happy family life behind the curtains. What was that address again? Dina asked. She hoped her voice didn't sound as scared as she felt. 884, said Chuck. 350, 422, read Jade from signs in the mailboxes. Keep going. Dina guided the Civic deeper and deeper down Fear Street. She usually loved to drive her mom's little car, but that night she wished it was something bigger and more powerful, like maybe a tank. Looming dead ahead in the darkness was the black shape of Fear Street Woods. There were only a few houses left now, and Dina began to hope that Chuck had been wrong about the address, that it wasn't 884 Fear Street, or even Fear Street at all, but Hawthorne, or Mill Road, or Canyon Drive, or... Up there, that's it, said Chuck. Just ahead of them was one more house, set apart from the neighboring houses, a two-story Victorian with battered shingles and a patchy lawn. Beyond it was nothing but the cemetery. Dina's headlights picked out 884 on a rusty mailbox. She parked in front of the house and cut the lights. 
The three teens looked at the house for a moment. It was in total darkness. In fact, it looked as if it had been completely deserted for years. There's no one home, Chuck, said Dina. You must have copied the wrong address. Maybe, Chuck said uncertainly, but I've got to check. I think Dina's right, Chuck, said Jade, sounding very nervous. This must be the wrong place. I'm just going to look around, said Chuck. You girls wait here. He opened the car door and started to get out. Dina remembered how fearlessly he had run to the burning car to rescue the dog. She knew he wasn't about to be talked out of his plan. There's a flashlight in the glove compartment, she said. Thanks, he replied. He took out the flashlight. Then, in the light from the ceiling bulb, he flashed his goofy grin for a moment. He shut the door and began to walk up the crumbling driveway. Dina and Jade sat silent in the darkness. Dina thought briefly of locking all the car doors, but then decided Chuck might have to get back in a hurry. Across the street, she could just make out the dark, looming shapes of trees in the Fear Street woods. On the far side of the house was the outline of the stone wall around the cemetery. From behind it, there was a faint, eerie glow from the moon. I don't know about you, but I'm not staying here another second, said Jade suddenly. I'm going with Chuck. Wait for me, said Dina. The two girls scrambled out of the car and started up the driveway after Chuck. As Dina felt the grapple crunch underfoot, she imagined it was broken bones and felt a shiver go through her. They found Chuck standing on the porch, his ear to the door. I rang the bell, he said. I can't hear anything. He knocked, tentatively at first, then louder. The curtains are all drawn, he said. Let's go see if there's anything around back. The girls followed him off the porch and around the side of the house. Something soft and sticky brushed against Dina's face as she stifled a scream. As she brushed it away, she realized it was a cobweb. Then she began to wonder what sort of spider had made that huge web. The shutters were closed all along the side of the house. When they got to the back door, Chuck suddenly raised his hand. Whoa, he whispered. The glass in the top half of the back door was broken, and the door itself was hanging slightly ajar. With Jade and Dina crowded in behind him, Chuck shone the flashlight through the broken window, revealing an old-fashioned kitchen. In the center of the room, a table lay on its side. All around, the floor was littered with broken dishes. Chuck swung the flashlight to the counter, where canisters and jars lay smashed. Their contents of flour, sugar, and spices spilled over the counter and onto the floor. Chuck let out a low whistle. This place has been ransacked, he said. I'm going in. As he swung the door open the rest of the way, it creaked in his hinges like the cry of some dead creature. Dina's heart was pounding so loudly she was sure the others could hear it. Holding her breath, she followed Chuck and Jade into the kitchen. Chuck continued to inch forward, aiming the flashlight just ahead of him. Then he stopped so suddenly, Dina and Jade nearly walked into him. Just beyond the door to the living room, illuminated by a circle of light, lay an outstretched arm. Next to its hand was a telephone receiver. Splattered over both were bright drops of red blood, running and collecting into a dark, spreading pool on the carpet. Chapter 8 For a moment nobody moved. Then Chuck began to walk toward the scene of horror, shining a flashlight ahead of him. Stay back, he warned the girls. He bent down, then stood up again quickly. It's a woman, he said in a shaky voice. I think she's been stabbed. Stabbed? shrieked Jade. Go back to the car, he said. She must have surprised whoever broke into the place. He might still be here. Dina had never been so scared in her life. Her legs were turning to overcooked spaghetti. Come on, she whispered. Jade, Chuck, let's get out of here. You two go on, Chuck said. I've got to find a phone. Let's call from somewhere else, said Jade. There may not be time, said Chuck. This woman needs an ambulance. He reached over to the wall and flicked on a switch. The sudden brightness was startling, and Dina had to blink several times before she could see. She stepped gingerly into the living room with Jade and suddenly felt faint. The woman was lying on her stomach. Beside her on the floor lay a big, blood-covered carving knife. Oh no, said Jade, her voice a faint moan. Involuntarily, she clutched Dina's hand. Dina glanced around the living room to avoid staring at the woman. The room looked as if a storm had blown through it. Lamps and ashtrays lay broken on the floor. The couch was slid open, its stuffing spilling out. Pictures were pulled from the walls and lay smashed with the other debris. Chuck was bent over one of the few standing tables, dialing a phone. Hello, he said. I want to report. Uh, before he could finish, he heard loud footsteps on the stairway to his left. Someone else is here, Jade cried. A large, heavy man dressed in a green overcoat and wearing a black ski mask appeared on the stairway. In his right hand, he held a tire iron. What are you doing here? He growled in a deep, hollow voice. You stabbed her, said Chuck. You broke in and stabbed her. You'll never get away with it. Drop the phone, the man said, chilling menace in his voice. He hurried down the last few stairs, the tire iron in front of him. 
and as Jade and Dina watched in horror, began to advance on Chuck. Chuck! screamed Dina. Look out! Chuck jumped to the side just as the tire iron came swinging down, narrowly missing his head. His eyes started wildly around the living room, then quickly came to a rest where the woman lay. He lunged forward, the masked man after him. Chuck quickly snatched up the carving knife and held it in front of him menacingly. Back off, mister, he said. The stranger stopped a moment, then nodded slowly. You won't use that knife, he said. Better put it down. Run, girls, cried Chuck. Quickly, Dina and Jade ran past the masked man and out the front door. Chuck kept the heavy, blood-splattered blade of the knife pointed at the intruder. Put down the knife, the man repeated in his deep voice. You'll never use it. He reached out one gloved hand as if to take the knife from Chuck. Chuck bounded toward the front door. When he reached it, he heaved the knife at the masked man. It hit the wall over the intruder's head and bounced to the floor. Chuck burst out the door, and then all three of them were running, running for their lives. Quick, get in, shouted Chuck. He shoved the girls into the back seat of the car, then ran around and slid into the driver's seat. Dina, the keys, he shouted. Dina frantically began to search through her jacket pockets. In the moonlight, they could see the masked man stumbling down the driveway. He was heading straight for them when she remembered. They're still in the ignition! Chuck flipped on the motor and floored the accelerator. With a squeal, the car spun away from the curb. Chuck gunned it to the end of the street. A dead end. Chuck! cried Jade. He's getting into his car! Hurry! Dina turned and saw the man get into an old model sedan in the driveway of the house. Chuck slammed the Civic into reverse. Hold on, he shouted. He gunned the car backward along the way they had come. The stranger pulled out of the driveway and was coming after them. Chuck continued to floor the pedal, flying backward past the dark houses all along Fear Street and out onto the mill road. Too late, Dina saw the lights of a big truck bearing down on them from the south. Look out, she shouted. Chuck wrenched the steering wheel and the Honda fishtailed onto the shoulder. The truck swerved past, just missing them as horn blaring. The little car was still skidding. Look out, we're going into a ditch, Dina screamed. But somehow Chuck managed to gain control. Breathing a sigh of relief, he spun the car around and began speeding north on the mill road. He's still following us, shrieked Jade. Faster! Which way? shouted Chuck. Turn left, cried Dina. With a protesting squeal, the little car turned onto Canyon Drive. The masked man's headlights are still behind them. Turn right, Dina screamed. Now left! The little car swerved so hard that Dina thought it might fall apart. They hit a deep hole in the road, and Dina's head hit the roof. Before she could regain her balance, Chuck had swerved again, and then again onto a narrow dirt road. Have we lost him? Jade cried, sounding weak. I think so, Chuck replied, staring hard into the rearview mirror. Let's go home, Dina said, feeling exhausted. We'll be safe there. Chuck turned the car up Park Drive and finally into the North Hill section of town where the Martinsons lived. All three teens breathed in deeply when the car finally pulled into the circular driveway and Chuck cut the motor. For a moment, they just sat in the car catching their breath. Then they heard the squeal of brakes and the sound of a car roaring up the hill toward the house. Feeling a chill run down her back, Dina looked down the road and saw headlights approaching fast. Oh no, cried Chuck. It's him. Chapter 9 Get inside, ordered Chuck. We'll be safe there. The three teens scrambled out of the car and onto the porch. But before they could get inside, the car roared straight toward them up the driveway, sending the gravel flying, its headlights glowing like the eyes of some evil animal. But instead of stopping, the stranger's car went all the way around the driveway, then sped away, heading back down Pine Road toward town. He's gone, said Jade, her voice trembling. Let's go in, said Chuck. We're safe now. Dina followed the others in. She wished her parents were home. Even more, she wished her hands would stop shaking. Chuck was already at the phone dialing 911. Hello, he said. Send an ambulance to 884 Fear Street. A woman has been stabbed. My name? Just say I'm um, the Phantom of Fear Street, he hung up. Chuck, said Dina dismayed. Why'd you say that? I can't give my real name, he said. I'm in enough trouble already. They want to know what we were doing at the house. What would I say? But what about the man, Dina protested. Shouldn't we report him? We didn't see his face, Chuck pointed out. We can't identify him, but he knows where we live. We'll just have to hope the police catch him. Dina felt funny about not doing more, but she decided Chuck was probably right. The night's events had thoroughly exhausted her, and she yawned. Chuck had moved onto the couch beside Jade and was gently stroking her hair. Dina was surprised to see tears drying on Jade's face. That was the worst night of my whole life, Jade said. I hope I wake up soon and find out it was all a nightmare. It was real all right, said Chuck, but it's over now. Dina saw Jade relax at Chuck's soothing words. 
but she couldn't help wondering if he was right. Was it really over? Later that night, Dina awakened from a deep sleep, the sound of car tires squealing in her ears. Her heart began thudding, but then she relaxed. I must have been dreaming about what happened, she thought. She wondered if Chuck and Jade were having nightmares, too. She and Chuck had driven Jade home just before midnight. When they returned, Dina's parents still weren't home. Dina had collapsed into her bed and immediately fallen asleep. But now, there it was again. A car was crunching the gravel in the driveway. A car door slammed, and then someone walked up the driveway toward the house. Oh, no, no, Dina pleaded silently. Don't let it be the man in a mask, please. The doorbell rang. A moment later, someone began pounding on the front door. Dina lay in her bed, too scared to move. Then she heard her father's sleepy voice. Just a minute. Then his voice step started down the stairs. Just a minute. Daddy, no, don't answer it. Dina jumped out of bed and ran down the hall, but it was too late. Her father had slid the chain back and was already opening the door. Wildly, Dina searched around for a weapon. All she could find was a large green vase on a stand at the top of the stairs. Her hands trembling, she grabbed it, then began to creep down the stairs. As the door swung all the way open, Dina expected to see the man in the mask standing on the porch. But instead, there were two men dressed in suits. One was tall and skinny, the other short and pudgy. They looked like a comedy act. Mr. Albert Martinson, said the tall man. That's me, said Dina's father. I'm Detective Frazier from the Shayside Police Department, the tall man said. This is my partner, Detective Monroe. We're sorry to disturb you at such a late hour, but this is very important. Do three teenagers live here? A boy and two girls? There are only two, said Mr. Martinson, a boy and a girl. What's all this about? May we speak to them, please? said the tall policeman. Do you know what time it is? said Mr. Mortensen. They're sleeping. Now, why don't you? We just want to ask them a few questions, said Fraser. Please, sir, we don't want to have to insist. All right. All right, Mr. Mortensen mumbled. While Dino watched, he stepped back to let the two men in. At first, she had been relieved to see the detectives instead of the masked stranger, but her relief was now replaced by a new kind of fear. She didn't know exactly what was going on, but she had an idea it meant trouble. She set the vase back on the stand and went downstairs. Daddy, she said. Mr. Martinson put his arm around her protectively. These gentlemen are detectives, he said. They want to ask you and Chuck some questions. By now, Mrs. Martinson had awakened and come downstairs. She was wearing a silver-colored bathrobe, with her thick golden hair frizzled around her face. She looked like a movie star, Dina thought. Albert, what's going on, she asked. These detectives want to talk to Dina and Chuck, he said. At two in the morning, Mrs. Martinson protested. They say it's important, her husband answered. Come on in the kitchen, said Dina's mother. I'll make coffee. Dina's father went to the door leading to the basement and called Chuck's name. There's someone here to see you, he said. After a few moments, Chuck stumbled up the steps and into the kitchen, rubbing sleep out of his eyes. He had thrown on a pair of faded jeans and a green t-shirt. When he first saw the policeman, his eyes filled with fear. But then, as Dina watched, the fear was replaced by a look of challenge and arrogance. Dina's mother had made the coffee. Won't you sit down, she asked the policeman. Thank you, ma'am, said Monroe. You go on ahead. He and Fraser remained standing by the back door. Dina's mother sat at the big kitchen table next to Dina. Both her parents looked worried, but the detectives had no expressions on their faces at all. What is going on? Dina wondered. Obviously, it had something to do with what had happened on Fear Street that night. Maybe the police wanted her and Chuck as witnesses, but how had they found them? While Detective Fraser took notes, his partner asked Chuck and Dina their names and ages and where they went to school. Then his expression became very serious. Where were you this evening between 9.30 and 11 p.m., he asked. Dina opened her mouth to answer, but Chuck spoke before she could say anything. We were right here, he said. We barbecued some hamburgers, then just hung out and watched TV. Dina shot Chuck a questioning look, but he wouldn't meet her eyes. And then she realized why he was lying. If her father found out what they'd been doing, Chuck would be in big trouble. Somehow, she had an idea he was already in a lot of trouble. The detective turned to her. Is that right, miss? he asked. You were here. Dina swallowed hard. Yes, she whispered. What's that? said Detective Monroe. Speak up. Yes, Dina repeated. Was anyone with you? Fraser asked. No, said Chuck. Yes, said Dina at the same moment. Well, said the detective, which is it, yes or no? No, Dina mumbled. It was just us. For a very long time, neither policeman said anything. Then they exchanged looks. Finally, Detective Fraser cleared his throat. Does either of you know a Mr. or Mrs. Farberson of 884 Fear Street, he asked. No, said Chuck. Dina looked at him desperately. She was starting to feel sick to her stomach. The lies were getting worse. The detective was leading up to something. But what? 
Has either of you ever talked to either Mr. or Mrs. Corbison on the phone? Detective Monroe asked. No, said Chuck. Or visited them at their house on Fear Street? No, Chuck exploded. We've told you we don't know any Farmersons. How many times do we have to tell you? Dina looked at Chuck. He looked angry, but something about his expression wasn't right. Suddenly, she realized that he was scared, as scared as she was. Mr. Martinson got to his feet. Officers, you've heard them, he said, his voice very angry. My kids aren't liars. Now get to the point. Once again, the policemen glanced at each other. We've got a witness who contradicts you, Monroe said. Are you sure you don't want to change your story? We've told the truth, said Chuck. He was staring straight ahead, and Dina could see a muscle in his cheek twitching. Her father was standing by the sink, his hands clenched in fists, while her mother sat unconsciously shredding a paper napkin with her fingers. Who is the witness? Dina wondered. Could it be Jade? But if it is, she's in trouble too. Maybe the neighbors had seen something. But we didn't see any neighbors. We didn't do anything wrong, she reminded herself. No matter what, we're innocent. Detective Fraser sighed. Our witness is Mr. Stanley Farberson, he said. According to him, you two and another teenage girl broke into his house and burglarized it. Then, when his wife came home unexpectedly, you murdered her. Dina gasped in shock. Huh? That's crazy, said Chuck. In the first place, we weren't anywhere near Fear Street. In the second place, we have no reason to steal anything or kill anyone. He claims he saw you, said Detective Prager. He gave us a license number, and it checks with yours. But what about the burglar, Dina blurted out. Dina, be quiet, Chuck's voice cut her off. Just a minute, Detective Frazier, Dina's father shouted. Even though he was wearing his rowdy old bathrobe, Dina thought he looked fierce and dangerous. Are my children being charged with a crime? Charged, said Mr. Frazier. Not yet, but we have... Hold it, said Mr. Martinson, cutting him off. He looked at Dina. Dina, he said, did you do the things you're accused of? Of course not, Daddy, she said. What really happened was... Her father cut her off with a shake of his head. He turned to Chuck. Chuck, he said. Did you do these things? No, said Chuck, his voice sullen. I don't know anything about it. Dina flashed a worried look at Chuck. Her father moved closer to Detective Fraser. I don't know what happened tonight, he said, but I do know my kids. They wouldn't do any such thing, and they wouldn't lie to me. I understand you're just doing your job, but they're not going to say another word without a lawyer. Detective Fraser nodded as if he wasn't surprised. I'm going to have to take them in, he said. For what? exploded Mr. Martinson. Because some crazy man thinks he saw them somewhere. You have no evidence. We have enough to hold them for further questioning, said Fraser. We've checked your car. The front bumper and tires are clotted with a green sandy clay that's only found at the end of Fear Street, where the Farbinsons live. It's still damp. Your car was there recently. The detective paused rather sadly. He looks directly at Dina, then at Chuck. Don't make this any more difficult than it already is, he said. Come downtown now, voluntarily. If you don't, I'll have to come back, with warrants for your arrest. Chapter 10 So far, so good. His plan had been accomplished even better than he had hoped. For once, luck was on his side. Things were definitely going his way. Now all he had to do was wait for another week. Wait and do nothing else, unless someone tried to get in his way. If that happened, well, one more murder wouldn't be so hard. In fact, it would probably be easier than the first one. Chapter 11 The Third Week of September Dina woke up Sunday afternoon at two. She lay in bed a moment, confused. Then everything that had happened the night before came flooding back like a nightmare. The detectives had put her and Chuck in the back of their unmarked car and taken them to police headquarters. Mr. and Mrs. Martinson followed in the BMW. The detectives told Dina's mother that her Honda would be impounded for evidence. Just before they drove off, Chuck had whispered fiercely to Dina, Don't say anything, Dina. We're innocent. Anything you say will make things worse. At the station house, everything looks just the way it did in the movies. There is a gruff-looking, gray-haired desk sergeant and battered gray metal desks covered with papers. Even though it was so late at night, there was a uniformed officer filling out a report and talking on the phone. Dina had only a couple of minutes to check out the place because soon after they arrived, she and Chuck were separated, and she was taken to a small room with no windows. She sat at a battered table with a scar on only on top, while the detectives began questioning her again. They kept asking her who the other teenager was who had been with them. Dina wanted to tell the truth, but remembered Chuck's warning, and she didn't want to get Jade in trouble. After a few minutes, Sidney Roberts, her father's lawyer, showed up. 
He talked some legal jargon with the detectives, and after a while they were out of the room. She was so tired by then that she didn't care much what happened. She wondered if she was going to be put in a jail cell. At least there will be a place to lie down, she thought. The next thing she knew, her father was shaking her. She had fallen asleep, bent over the table with her hands cradling her head. Come on, honey, her mother said. We can go home now. Dina stood up shakily, yawning. What happened? she asked. We're letting you go for now, said Detective Monroe from the doorway. But we want to talk to you again. Don't leave town. Dina almost laughed. Sure, she thought, as if I had anywhere to go. But how do you run away from a nightmare? She followed her parents through the halls of the building, then out into the chilly night air. To the east, the sky was getting lighter. She had never stayed up so late before. They walked out into the parking lot before she remembered. Chuck, she said. Where's Chuck? They've arrested him, said her father, sounding grim. What? said Dina, suddenly wide awake with shock. This isn't the first time he's been in trouble with the police, her father went on, his voice weary and sad. Last year in Center City, Chuck and some other boys were caught joyriding in a stolen car. But, Dina protested, that doesn't have anything to do with what happened tonight. Her father suddenly looked very old, very weary. The police checked his file in Center City, he said. There is a record of his fingerprints. And... It seems that they matched the fingerprints on the knife that was used to murder Mrs. Farberson.